this video we are going to discuss about convolutional neural networks some more details so a quick recap what is a CNN uh, CNN means we have got an input which is high dimensional very high dimensional it could be an image which is generally of size uh, let's say 1000 cross 1000 cross 3 because there are three channels RGB so therefore we have an image which is very large or it could be any other input also which is very large so what we are doing is we are trying to find local patterns here and then collate them all together to be able to classify whether this is this particular class or not or even regress on it for example prediction of something so this is CNN uh, so what small small uh, uh, patterns we can search we take a small kernel let's say in general this could be uh, some width some height and some depth so width height and depth and uh, our kernel also has got some width which is let's call f some height f dash so this is these are the dimensions of our filter or kernel and the depth will be same as the depth of our original image so this is d only so this is my filter and in this way i can take k number of filters and what each filter will do it will scan the whole image and so this whole image goes as input to this set of filters and it will return some output and every filter will give me one matrix as output so when we go to the next filter we get next output next output next output in this way so finally uh, we get k outputs or k channels this is cnn a convolutional neural network now let's see a little bit more about it so we have uh, an input size w1 cross h1 cross d1 this is my input now mind it that this is a 2d convolution which means we are convolving only across WH, not across D, because my kernel length is same as D. This is my kernel. This is this length is same as D. I am not or D1. I'm not convolving across the D dimension. Only across two dimensions I am convolving. So that's why I would like to call it as two-dimensional convolution. Nobody stops you from doing three-dimensional convolution. Nobody stops you from doing one dimensional convolution. But the thing is that uh, the, the, uh, what kind of patterns you are interested in. If your patterns are in 3D, then go ahead with 3D convolution. If your patterns are in one dimension, go ahead with your 1D convolution. But here we are taking the example of 2D convolution. Now, uh, the question is, okay, so the given is W1 is the input size h1 and d1 this is the input shape and our hyperparameters are we have filter size of f f dash you don't have to be told this is b1 depth because this is anyway same as this it's a two dimensional convolution stride length is very important how much uh, when i'm scanning then what is my the shift of my kernel let's say if stride length is one this means i shift my kernel by one unit or by one pixel uh, or by one element every time then zero padding this concept of zero padding means uh, see uh, let's say i have this is my input maybe i have got five inputs if my kernel has a size of three then it will multiply here and then it will return some number here some number maybe 8 then it will be let's say stride is 1 it will take this these three entries and it will output something maybe 7 then again it will shift it will return something maybe 6 
But what is the meaning of zero padding? I, ex I add some extra entries here. Uh, in this case, I'm adding zero padding means zero only. Then what happens? I will get this output also, let's say something five. And then similarly here, this output also appears, let's say two. So I get two extra outputs here if I'm adding two uh, uh, zero padding, a uh, zero padding of length two on each side or length one on each side, which means two total. And then the thing is number of filters is given. So we have similar K filters. The question is what will be the output shape? W1, H1, D1. So I output uh, my output has some shape. What is the output shape? W1, H1, D1. Now, one thing is very clear that the depth is equal to K, right? Because I have K filters, every filter will give me a two dimensional output, uh, and I will stack together all these. Sorry, I will stack together the outputs of all these filters so that I get k outputs. So this is clear, d1 is equal to k. Now what about h1, sorry this is d2, I'm so sorry. So this is d2 is equal to k. Now what about h2 and w2? Is there a relationship with h1 and w1? Yes, there is. And how do we find out that relationship? If you remember your uh, convolution discussion in our previous lectures, or if you remember correlation, cross-correlation discussion in our previous lectures, then you may very easily remember, uh, you may very easily be able to derive. Uh, I will take an example here just to derive it. So let's say this is my input and my, uh, this is my W1 is equal to seven basically. Right, one, two, three, four, five, six. I am considering each dimension independently because no, that's what convolution does. It considers each dimension. Uh, it, it moves along each dimension independently. So uh, now I take, let's say my f is equal to three. So let's say I have this filter. Now the question is, okay, now my I have some stride. This is my filter length f. I have some stride. So let's say I have some stride, maybe two. Right. So this is my stride. This is my stride. Okay. I right. Filter length is three, but stride is two. Now the question is, how many times I I will be able to shift the window? So if I uh, let's say, let's count the uh, number of times I'll be able to shift the window. So let's say it is um, um, let's say this is W1 total. So what I will do is first of all I will subtract this F from W1. So I say W1 minus f right i have subtracted this f now whatever is remaining this i have to divide by s to be able to get how many times the window is shifting right it starts from here this is my zero this is my one then this is my two right so which means whatever is the remaining length i divide it by stride and that many uh, jumps i'm able to make uh, means that many outputs I will get. But then the original W also gave me some output, which is, so I will add one to it, right? So my W2 is basically equal to uh, W1 minus F means whatever is remaining, divided by S, so that many strides I get so here, two strides, plus one because one was the original window. So this is total is three. So W2, in this case, my W2 is equal to three. And you can see that from here, one, two, and three, right? And sometimes it is possible that this may not be an integer, 
so i will i can take a lower floor of this basically floor which means the smallest in or the uh, largest integer which is less than this number which means you remove the decimal part and only take the integer part so that is the floor just like you round off round off will take you to the nearest integer but floor will take you to the immediately lower integer so that's how i am able to compute now here i did not consider the case of zero padding if i have some zero padding also let's say i have some this is p entries are here and p entries are here then i will have to add here so w1 plus 2p because the total length i am traversing is plus 2p right so w1 plus 2p the total length minus f plus or oh, sorry divide by s that is the number of jumps i made plus 1 for the original window so in this way i have, i can derive the output dimensions now let's summarize so my w2 is w1 plus 2p minus f upon s plus 1 similarly h2 is equal to h1 plus 2p minus f dash divided by s plus 1 and d2 is anyways we know it is equal to k so in this way i can derive my output shape given the input shape now what you have to notice here is that my output shape is directly proportional to the input shape my w2 is directly proportional to w1 my h2 is directly proportional to h1 d is not proportional so only my output width and height are proportional to the input width and height this means if i give a large window as input i will get a large window as output if i give a small window as input i will get a small uh, window as output so which means if i give a large image as input i will get some large output small input small output so which means my cnn can adapt or it can uh, handle any input size right my cnn can handle any input size is an important point cnn can handle variable input size whereas our dense layers could not the dense layer could not handle but in cnns can handle in variable input size now some um, uh, information that generally we use odd sized kernels which means the filters are generally odd in size like f and f dash oh and this is not k this is f or f dash generally f or f dash they are equal to 3 5 7 or so on uh that's just a convention we don't use odd uh, even size or just odd size similarly now the question is uh when is it possible that my output size is same as the input size so my output size is same as the input size which means my w2 is equal to w1 then what happens w2 is equal to w1 then my s should be equal to 1 right and what i get is 2p plus sorry 2p minus f plus 1 is equal to 0 which means p is equal to f minus 1 upon 2 right so for w2 is equal to w1 right this conditions should happen S should be equal to one, and P should be zero. Padding should be equal to F minus one upon two. So this is F minus one upon two. So P in the W direction is F minus one upon two, and P in the H direction uh, is F dash minus one upon two. Generally, we take F is equal to F dash. Generally, it's not mandatory, but generally, you can if you want to find patterns which are some other kind of patterns then you can take different f and f dash then another point is uh, you remember that we have a, a gradient descent algorithm for uh, updating the weights of the model so generally um, 
we use ReLU activation to avoid vanishing gradients. So what does that mean? If we have multiple layers in my network, uh, if you remember the backpropagation algorithm, my uh, do L upon do W, this is getting multiplied by the derivatives of nonlinearity. So let's say sigma 1 minus sigma for this layer, then sigma 1 minus sigma for this layer, then again sigma 1 minus sigma for this layer to be able to update this weight. Now the derivative of uh, 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 the sigmoid function can be very small because you remember the sigmoid function is like this, which means the derivative is very small here, derivative is very small here, only in this small region you have a large derivative, but here derivatives are very small. That's why when you are multiplying very small, small terms, what you get ultimately is a really, really small term. That's why your gradients are very small. This means your update will be very small. So w is w minus eta times dou L upon dou w. Now since this term is very small, therefore the update is also very small and my weights don't change much. This means I am not able to learn very effectively. Right? My training will take very, very long time and most likely my training will be stuck in some local minimum because of the noisy uh, error profile. This is W, this is the error or the loss. And my because the updates are so small, it may get stuck in some local minimum. So therefore, this problem is known as the problem of vanishing gradients. And how do we avoid it? To avoid it, we just have to ensure that the gradient of my nonlinearity is large. Therefore, we use ReLU, non ReLU activation so that the gradient of my nonlinearity is large. This is a nonlinear function. This is x and this is ReLU of x. Now, if you see the derivative, the derivative here is 1, derivative here is 0. So, which means if you are in this range, if there is no end to it, it's like it goes from 0 to infinity. So, wherever you are in the positive x, your output will be, uh, will always have a gradient of 1, which means this uh, term will not put any hindrance to the calculation of your gradients, the final weight updates. Okay, so because in CNNs generally uh, we use very deep networks, very deep CNNs, it could have up to 50 layers or 100 layers. Uh, so therefore, it's important that vanishing gradients are avoided. Now, some more concepts which we need to discuss here. One concept is called pooling. Uh, what is pooling? So generally, the inputs become very large. As you have seen here, my inputs could be very large in CNNs. Let's say 1000 cross 1000 input and then some depth. So we would like to make our inputs smaller. So we use some kind of downsampling. So we downsample with uh, our inputs. Uh, so what is the what is what does it look like? Let's say this is our input image or input to the pooling layer, and my pooling has f equal to two. This is a parameter. The size of my pooling filter is two cross two. Let's say, and my stride generally we take equal to f. Generally, uh, nobody forces you to do that, but generally S is equal to F. So let us say this is the case here. So if my S is equal to F and F is equal to 2, what is my output size? You can compute input size plus the padding. And I we don't use padding here minus the F, which is 2 divided by padding, which is 2 plus 1. So this is how much 2 minus 2 is sorry, 4 minus 2 is 2, 2 upon 2 is 1, 1 plus 1 is 2. That's for 2 cross 2 output, right? Now, what we need to do is we need to apply this operation. So this downsampling is done with some operation. That is not simple downsampling that take this entry, take this entry, no. It is some operation. So let's say max pooling. So the operation is max. So you take this window, find the maximum entry here, which is 6. So you get 6 here. Take this window, See the maximum entry here. So this is max pooling we are discussing. Uh, take this window. What is the maximum entry? 8. Take this window. What is the maximum entry? It is 6. 
take this window what is the maximum entry is 9 this is my output now somebody can also use average pooling average pooling means you take this window and take the average of it so what is the average of this 2 plus 3 is 5 so 15 16 so total is 16 divided by 4 4 so my output will be 4 in case this is max pooling and this is the case of average pooling so my output will be 4 here and then this is 8 plus 2 plus 16 again 4 and this is 6 plus 4, 13 13 upon 4 so approximately 3.25 and then this is 9 plus 2 11 16 again 4 but this is my average pooling result um, so I can use either of these generally people use max pooling uh, but you can use whatever you want generally max pooling is popular so this is like an an extra is like an, a layer on it in its own so how many trainable parameters are there in this layer no trainable parameters right well, how many uh, hyper parameters are there so we have hyper parameter like f s these are my hyper parameters which i have to set before i train the model Okay. Now another operation which is very common is flattening operation. So you convert your matrix into a vector. Why do you need it? You need it to give this as an input to a dense layer. So take a dense layer here. So dense layer cannot take a matrix as an input. It only can take a vector as an input. So you just convert your matrix into a vector. So this is the flatten layer or a flatten operation. So no parameters are needed here, no hyperparameters are needed here, it just converts your matrix into a vector or, or a tensor also, it could be a three dimensional thing, even that will be converted into a vector. And then this vector you can use for any other purpose, generally people use it for uh, giving as input to a dense layer. Now, okay, some more interesting questions now. So we are getting a little bit more mathematical, but this is very simple mathematics. I hope you will be able to appreciate that. The input size is W1, H1, D1. Right? I have my input is W1, H1, D1. And hyperparameters are same, FF dash for my, sorry. F and F dash. For my kernel, this is my kernel, and then the depth is same, you know, and then we have got k kernels, and zero padding is p here, and here also p, here also p, here also p, everywhere zero padding is p, only along the two dimensions, not along the depth. For along depth, we don't need any zero padding. Uh, then the output shape is this. What is the number of trainable parameters here? Right? Generally, it is important to know the number of trainable parameters. Why? Because if my model is very large, it has too many trainable parameters. This means I also need a lot of data to be able to train my parameters. If my data is small, number of parameters is very large, then my model won't be able to learn efficiently. My model, model won't generalize. It will mostly, it will overfit to the data. We have seen this in our previous discussions also. Now the question is, what is the number of trainable parameters in this setup? So the answer is, okay, number of trainable parameters per filter. Let's see in this filter, how many trainable parameters are there? The answer is F into F dash into D into D1 into D1, right? So this is the size of my kernel and this whole kernel is made up of parameters, trainable parameters only. So F, F dash into D1, this is the number of parameters here, plus one for the bias term, right? You have a bias term also. So plus one for the bias term. And so this is in one kernel and you have K kernels or k filters so you multiply this with k this is the total number of parameters in this layer of cnns so this is the answer ff dash d1 plus 1 into k this is the 
total number of parameters in my CNN model. Another question which is very relevant here is what is the computational complexity of CNN? Why this is important? This is important because generally we implement our deep learning models uh, on some device, right? We may be, it may be a mobile phone or it may be a server, it could be anything. Uh, uh, so how do we uh, ensure that our model is not taking up too much time to do the computations? Or we want to know how many, how many uh, users can be served simultaneously. Let's say our server has some computational, com computational capacity so, and we know how much one CNN or one model will consume, how much computations one model will require. Then we can accordingly say at a time, these many users can use our uh, service on this server. So therefore it is important to know the number of computations. Let's see in CNN, what is the number of computations? So, okay, we have some input W1, H1, D1 and we have some kernel ff ff dash and uh, d1 stride is given zero padding is given now number of computations in the forward pass now see uh, let's say to compute one output this is my output size right my output is this to compute this single output how many computations are required so generally when we say computations we take the number of multiplications only additions are not considered because multiplication is a costly operation on a device or on a uh, cpu or uh, my computational device uh, multiplication is a costly operation which takes significant amount of time whereas addition is a very simple operation it as compared to multiplication. Therefore, we are more interested in the number of multiplications, which is the bottleneck. So how many multiplications are needed to be able to compute single output? So let's see. So to be able to compute this, what we'll do is we will take this filter, let's call it as W. So, okay, there is some notational overload, but some W. And then basically you take a small window here, uh, which is let's say X. And you take a dot product, the element wise product, and then sum over all the entries, oh, but plus you add some bias also, that is fine. So how many computations are required? So size of W, uh, basically equal to size of W, right? Which means FF dash times D1. These many multiplications are involved to compute single output. Now we have got how many outputs? W2 into H2 into D2, these many outputs. So how many computations total into W2, H2, D2. This is the total number of computations we need to be able to compute the entire output in the forward pass. Forward pass means in this direction, input to output direction. So that's what we have written here. In one filter, you need F, F dash, D1 time, it, so many multiplications. Now for scanning the entire input, you need uh, these many computations. And for scanning the entire input with all the filters, you need these many. Basically, uh, this is the total output size. So total output elements are these many. For each element, you need these many computations. That's how we compute the number of computations in our convolutional neural network. So that's it. Now, what did we learn in this uh, lecture? We saw CNNs. We saw how do we compute the output size of the CNN, how do we compute the number of parameters of the CNN, how do we compute the number of computations in a CNN, and we also saw some other layers like pooling, like uh, flatten, etc. So these are all things we discussed in this lecture. Thank you very much.